the creative sector, including artists and arts organizations, has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. There's been a precipitous drop in revenue and widespread unemployment that hasn't shown any signs of rebounding yet. So our conversation today is going to engage in two intertwined questions. What can cities do to help artists and cultural organizations get back on their feet? And what role can the arts play in civic and economic recovery from the multiple crises plaguing our cities? I'm Kate Levin, principal at Bloomberg Associates, a pro bono consulting firm that advises cities. And I'm joined by two major cultural leaders, Camila Forbes, executive producer of the fabled Apollo Theater in Harlem, and Hank Willis Thomas, one of the most important visual artists working today in the U.S. Um, I'd like to start our conversation with a question from the city's point of view. There may be increasing awareness of the value of arts and culture to cities, but the details are often a bit hazy for the leaders who have to make excruciating decisions these days. So my question to each of you, and I'm going to start with Camila, what advice would you give city leaders? Why should they take a risk, as it may seem to them, to invest in the arts? What can the sector do that is of special, urgent value right now? The arts have the power to keep people close. It reminds us of our empathy, and it reminds us of our humanity. Um, this past year has shown us how much we need all three of those things, um, being close, being empathetic, um, and, and also looking towards each other for our own humanity. I mean, I think the biggest challenge right now is that I'm, I'm very clear that this pandemic has been destructive of our health infrastructure. Um, and up until a couple months ago, I wasn't sure if we were going to see our way back <laughs> from a particular, you know, having a very specific national health plan, which I'm very clear on now that we will have a national health plan to see our way out of this health pandemic. But what about the um, PTSD pandemic? Right? What about the mental health pandemic? What about the transformational healing around our citizens within this country? That is where the arts and civic leadership need to work hand in hand to truly orchestrate the sense of healing, to truly help to teach us how to feel again. We literally have not been in physical spaces with one another, with citizens, with neighbors, with loved ones in over a year. This is really destructing sort of the core essence of who we are as humans. So, so that is, it is, it is, that's what I think is most important is how do we see artists as civic leaders to develop a civic plan with urban planets, planning and, and leadership um, to, to develop a path to healing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're, 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 we have not had a conversation before, we never met before, but we're both thinking a lot about artists as civic leaders and the role of healing um, within our communities as uh, part of the, the responsibility and the, the lane which artists can serve. Um, I think civic leaders also could broaden them, their perspectives of their role to be seen as creative. You know, uh, urban planning is an art form, uh, writing laws is an art form. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, participating in civic life is the greatest creative collaboration uh, that there is, right? That because you, uh, some call it bureaucracy. <laughs> I think a lot, a lot, another way of looking at it is uh, collaborative community making. And, and, um, and what we call art actually allows us to relate to a lot of things that we think we already know very differently. No artist makes work about right now or for right now. We we make things with anticipation that they will have an impact on the future. And so we're living in the future. And I believe that the investment in that future thinking is actually going to be fruitful um, for the country and for the world. So Camila, what would you advise a city leader to think about in terms of a narrative of recovery? What do you see 
pieces of that arc are as particularly, you know, given your extraordinary expertise as a theater artist? So as a city leader, it is about how can we vision possibility for tomorrow, right? Um, art is a democratizing tool. And guess what? So has this pandemic democratized us all uh, almost in a way of, a, of really equalizing a, a sense of playing field, if you will, to, to think anew, to restart anew. Um, so from a city leader point of view, I think it's about when we think about returning back to normal, understanding that we are visioning a new possibility of normal. This is an opportunity to truly rethink, refashion, reshape um, our cities, our neighborhoods, um, our towns, our cultural life in a, in a vastly new way. Um, so, you know, I think that as artists, that's what we do every time we enter a new project. We almost, you know, we leave, behind, we take with us what we learned from the last project, but it is about creating amongst a blank slate. Um, and and I think city leadership has to be that bold, um, take that kind of bold steps forward um, um, as, as artists do every single day. So what have you learned specifically at the Apollo from this closure period? So I've learned resiliency. Um, uh, we've learned that, you know, culture cannot be canceled. Um, you know, as much as our building has been closed, we've had to pivot um, to the digital space in order to connect with community. We've also learned that as an arts institution, it is not just art that we are connecting, but we had have to, we had had to fill in gaps where, um, where, where leadership had not, where we had provided information for food banks, information for, you know, places where people can get tested through our program Apollo Care. Um, art centers really serve as community conveners. And that's one thing I think in the last 10 months we've really been able to see is that so many, whether it's art centers, churches, other, you know, formal and informal gathering spaces, um, you know, had to fill in the gaps as, as, as really civic leaders within our communities. Hank, my, my version of that question for you, you have created so many contributions to the public realm through projects like for freedom uh through the truth booth through uh the unity sculpture um for those of us in brooklyn to get to see that uh through rise up um in montgomery alabama so many cities are dealing with complexities around monuments around memorials how do you look at your work in terms of creating a conversation with your audiences and, and how do you think civic leaders should try and understand what's in the public realm? I think m my role in, in the work that I do in the public realm is really inspired by the idea that there are people who aren't yet born that I and we have things to say to. And the objects we put in the public, the buildings we build, really are, are a message to them. And we want them to be thinking, looking backwards, but with an eye towards the future so that they don't make the mistakes that we have made in the past. And I think that does require critical thinking and having questions embedded in public space. Whereas uh, what I grew up with, most of us grew up with were statements about who was important and why because they're on a horse and on a pedestal <laughs> but not why they were important and who was not being included and so i i really feel that uh, public art has a responsibility of opening minds and, and, and sparking curiosity so that we can look deeper into our past so that we can have a more fulfilling future so a lot of times city leaders are very comfortable with business sectors having an arc from incubation to profit center. Culture does that, but that's not always as evident. And Camila, I'm wondering if you can talk about your journey uh, with the ta Coates piece, Between the World and Me, because that certainly started in the nonprofit world and ended up on HBO. Can you give us a, a, a vision of what that's about? Sure. 
Um, so in 2000, obviously, Ta-Nehisi co-wrote a book in uh, 2015 that became a National Book Prize winner between the world and me, um, really became a voice amongst the rising Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the book was, was how to tell, write letters to his young 15-year-old son, what does it mean to be a Black man in America in the age, Black boy in America in the age of Trayvon Martin. 2018, I decided to trans translate that work for the stage um, and with the work of, you know, with the support of the Apollo theater in which commissioned and produced the work along with the Kennedy Center. So it was truly incubated within a nonprofit structure, within a nonprofit institution, um, within mission-based institution. Uh, the work then lived as a stage production in that toured New York, Washington, D.C., and Atlanta. Uh, in 2020, um, obviously, amongst the backdrop of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we knew that we needed to have another, we had to have an artistic response, an institutional response response and we couldn't gather. So theater is not possible in that realm. So started to have conversations with media partners and one of those media partners who had aligned values around social justice and around art and social justice was actually HBO. Um, so we shot it completely during the age of COVID. Um, but amidst that also, what was very important to us um, and making this film was to make sure that as we were entering the corporate sector, that the corporate sector was also able to support the nonprofit sector that supported this work. So um, HBO made um, an incredible gift um, of one million um, from Warner Media to Apollo Theater for their work amongst arts and social justice in the landscape of arts and social justice. Um, and so that that to us was, again, a really interesting hybrid relationship between the nonprofit and for-profit world. Uh, the world. The work aired in November of 2020 um, and continues to live on the platform to today. So if you had to say one thing to your neighbors on 125th Street about the value of the Apollo, what would it be? We are home, just home. And Hank, one of the things you've talked about is how there's not enough room for ambiguity in cities. Do you still feel that way? And what do you think is the role of the arts in helping create, I guess, productive ambiguity? Well, I mean, there were a lot of terrible things that we experienced uh, over 2020 and into 2021. Uh, some of the most beautiful things I saw in New York City in 2020 were the creative ways that people gathered uh, safely to uh, share their voices. And one of the most exciting ones for me was on Juneteenth, uh, where there was like a impromptu uh, concert parade that stopped in front of the Apollo and uh, was just a celebration of, of, of joy and community. And uh, we took over the streets with uh, black joy, with civic joy. And um, that kind of experience reminded me of how just people willing to say yes to something new and something different in the spirit of positivity and community can open the minds of, 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 of uh, and fill voids. And that's what creativity is. It doesn't have to live on a canvas. It doesn't have to have something sanctioned. It, it just has to have a spirit that is undeniably good. And that's the, and so there's that kind of ambiguity. Um, uh, I think the late John Lewis would call um, good trouble. Yes. And, and, and that's essential to the fabric of any healthy city. Um, always has been will be going forward. Well, thank you both so much, Hank and Camila. And now back to our City Lab host, Errol Lewis.